So for class today, we'll be going over uh, taxonomy. And so this is kind of bridging the morphology unit we just did with what we're going to be doing next. And so in the next unit in class, we're going to be uh, practicing identifying unknown species. And we're going to do that in a series of phases that simulate different situations. Uh, so as I just discussed on Thursday, we'll be using online resources to identify pictures and descriptions of trees that people might send you. Then what we're going to do all next week in class will be in here. And next week, I'm going to bring in a bunch of actual specimens I collect. And what you all will do is you'll work in groups. And next Tuesday in class, be sure to bring in all the course textbooks you have and any tree ID books that you want. And we'll simulate if you're out in the field and you don't have access to internet or Wi-Fi and you're trying to identify unknowns if you're doing field work. And so we'll use print resources, dichotomous keys. We'll go over all that next Tuesday. And then you'll try and identify the unknown species that I bring in. Um, then what we're going to do Thursday is we're going to put those first two together. So I'm going to bring in a bunch of uh, specimens on next Thursday. And you can use your phones, computers, tablets, books, whatever you want to try and identify those unknowns. And for each of these days, it'll be bonus points uh, for however many of the unknowns you're able to identify. So taxonomies kind of kind of bridge the morphology lecture to the um, identification exercises. And so when we look at taxonomy, how I have this lecture set up, basically there's whole courses on plant taxonomy at the junior, senior level, graduate level. It's a huge field, but we're kind of going over it in about 50 minutes, all of it. So uh, it's going to be kind of the 100,000 foot overview of a much broader topic. So with plant taxonomy, uh, we do it for a number of different reasons. Uh, organization is going to be really important. And you'll see as we learn more and more and more species in lab, keeping them all straight becomes a more and more difficult task. And so by using what we learn about plant taxonomy, it's actually going to help us organize all this complex information. And it actually becomes easier the more species you learn to remember the scientific names than even the common names. They, they tend to make more sense the more plants you learn. Um, the other reason we're doing it is for communication. Uh, so when you're doing a research paper or looking at old literature, you know, we've got those scientific names. So as the common names may change over time or may be different in different places, the scientific names will help us communicate all over the world uh, with folks talking about these same species of trees. And some of our tree species really do have a global distribution now. Ginkgo biloba is planted all over the world as an ornamental. Lavalle pine is planted all over the world uh, as a timber production tree, even though it's only native to the southern U.S. Um, with taxonomy, it's now done on a phylogenetic basis, and this kind of builds around the idea of Occam's razor, where all of the things being equal, the simplest explanation is likely to be most true. So a lot of our taxonomy, it used to be all done morphologically. This Organism looks like this organism, so they're probably related. Let's put them in the same group, okay? But what we've realized is the real world is more complex than that. Uh, sometimes two organisms look similar. Think about dolphins and sharks where they look similar, but they may not be closely related to one another. They've just evolved to look similar because they're operating in the same environment. We have trees that work like that too, where you may have two taxa, that look very similar to one another, where you may have sourwood and black gum, are very similar trees, but they may not be closely related to one another. Um, so what we've done is we've gone with this phylogenetic approach where we now use the molecular markers and we make the simplest story we can on the evolutionary tree based on what the actual DNA is telling us. And that's how we drive modern plant taxonomy. Yeah, Logan. Switching over to uh, phylogenetic rather than uh, taxonomical naming. Um, don't we run into the issue sometimes where uh, an organism changes genus or we put in a different genus? Yeah, so, so bio, it's all still taxonomy. We're just using phylogenetics based on molecular information now more than morphology, but it's all still taxonomy. And it is changing uh, some of our classification. And you know we, we have to keep up with that. It's difficult to keep up with. And so to give you some examples, in class this semester, I'm using USDA plants as our source of taxonomy. And so in forestry, we're kind of in a unique middle ground where we work with members of the public, we work with loggers, 
Uh, many loggers may have a high school education and we're communicating about these different tree species with them. We work with other foresters, you're working with all sorts of different professionals. So we need to be able to communicate to a lot of different people. So USDA plans is kind of a middle ground where it's not as up to date as the most up to date molecular data is suggesting. It's not following the angiosperm phylogeny groups third revision, for example, if you're familiar with that, but it's not so out of date as some older textbooks maybe. So it's kind of a middle ground. Uh, but if you look at the most up to date taxonomy, the maples have been moved to the Sapindaceae family. Sweet gum's been moved out of the Hamamelidaceae into the Altingiaceae. Uh, Sugarberry's been moved out of the Elm family and into the Cannabaceae family. Uh, the Viburnums have been moved over to the Adoxaceae. So it has changed our understanding. We, we started with one kind of view of the tree of life here, if you will, and we realized we got some of the branches wrong. Um, so that, that can be frustrating because you learned it one way and now it's something else. Uh, but they're revising it because we think the way you, we learned it might have been a little bit wrong. So we're kind of running a middle ground here in this. The nice thing about all the taxonomy we're learning is it's, it is uh, hierarchical, uh, which means it's built on levels uh, where you've got bigger groups that are subdivided into smaller groups, which are subdivided into yet smaller groups all the way on down, and that really helps us understand it better. A lot of this started uh, with Carolus Linnaeus, a Swedish biologist who classified a lot of different taxa in the mid-1700s. Um, and so when you look up a tree name today, when you look in the literature, you might find Lavalli pine, written out as Pinus taeda, and after that it'll have an L period. Um, our different taxa will have different botanical attributions, where they're attributing credit to the person that first described that species. And if you see an L period after it, that's Linnaeus. So Linnaeus described a lot of our taxa, including Lava Uh Linnaeus also uh, put together that binomial system where you have the genus and the specific epithet and you use both to refer to a plant. Uh, so came up with a, a number of different innovations, then did a lot of work uh, classifying organisms. Uh, the Germans sort of claimed credit for him, called him Carl von Linn, so you can see that on the photo there, uh, but he, he was Swedish. And so here's the hierarchical nature of how we classify plants. And so with plants, you can see they may be a little bit different from animals where we have divisions instead of phyla, uh, but we go from the division level on down to the specific epithet level, where it's division class. Sometimes you have a subclass, sometimes you don't order, family, genus, and specific epithet. The nice thing about these is they all end in the same five or six letters. The divisions all end in Ophida, the class all ends in Opsidae, then Edae, Ailes, and Aceae. So if you look at Magnolia, for example, we learned Southern Magnolia in lab last week. Um, it's gonna be in the Magnolia Ophida division, the Magnolia Opsida, the Magnolia Edae subclass, Magnolia Ailes order in the Magnolia Aceae family. It usually doesn't work that way. It's usually not just all the way down. It's all the same. Usually it, it differs, uh, but in, for some of them, it's pretty easy. For the purposes of our lecture today, I'm going to be going over plant orders because that sort of gives us, you know, a broader overview than families, but still not so broad that we're up here looking at the class. Remember again, you need the binomial name. So you need two levels here, the genus and the specific epithet in order to correctly describe a single taxa. On some of those bonuses you all turned in, you were listing trees as rubrum, alcata, but that doesn't tell me what tree it is. That just tells me maybe something about it is red, maybe something about it is curved, but because you don't also include the genus, I don't know if you're talking about red maple or southern red oak. So you need both of those. Here's some more examples on why you need both. So this is an Eastern red cedar we'll learn in lab this week. This is a common persimmon we'll learn in lab this week. I don't think anyone has ever mixed the two up on a quiz. They're completely different trees. One's a gymnosperm, one's an angiosperm. They look nothing alike, but they both have Virginiana as the specific epithet. So if you just tell me Virginiana, I don't know which of those or dozens of other organisms you're actually referring to. But if you use the genus as well, Juniperus or Diospyros, now we all know exactly which tree you're talking about. Same thing, we've already learned in week one, 
Are you going to confuse a water oak and a river birch on a quiz this week? I don't think anyone will make that mistake. They're very different looking trees, but they both have the nigra as the specific epithet. So if you just include nigra, then I don't know which one you're referring to. So you always have to use both those names when you're using the scientific name of the tree, or it doesn't mean that. Okay, so some of you were already asking me on lab last week, how do you capitalize these trees? How do you use the names? And so the scientific names are easy because they never change. Family and genus are always capitalized. The first letter is always capitalized. Specific epithets are always lowercase. And then they're usually either italicized or underlined. So if you're typing it up and you're doing some technical report, you're listing species, the families should not be italicized, but the genus and the specific epithet should be italicized. Um, with the underlining there, so there's Dr. Bug, our own Dr. Cole Baby. Uh, for some reason, his high school yearbook photo is on the internet. Uh, so I photoshopped him onto somebody else's body with a typewriter. Underlining used to be the convention because typewriters could underline. Okay, but now we have laptops and computers and tablets and we're processors. And so no one's underlining anymore. We're all using a tablet. Uh, some schools you go to, um, even here in the South, they may still make you underline the genus and specific epithet on a quiz sheet or you lose points for misspelling, but we're not going to worry about that because no one's really doing any underlining anymore. So with the common names now, you use conventional rules of English. So one of the very common things we see in silviculture, management plans, other upper level classes, is everybody loves to capitalize the common names of trees. So if you're typing up a sentence and you write, we have water oak and laurel oak and willow oak on this property, the common thing we see is everyone's capitalizing the first letter of water and oak and then laurel and oak, they're all capitalized. That's incorrect. You follow conventional rules of English grammar on capitalization of common names. So if I start a sentence with water oak, water oak is a tree, the W is capitalized, the O is lowercase because you start a sentence with a capital letter. But if these names are just in the middle of a sentence, they should not be capitalized. The only exception to that is if part of the name is a proper noun. So places and people's names are proper nouns and should be capitalized. So wherever in a sentence American Beauty Berry follows, American is capitalized, just like you would when you wrote it out in any other context. Texas is capitalized on Texas Azalea. Uh, some of these tree names are named after botanists. So Douglas fir would be an example. Coulter pine would be an example. So there you capitalize Douglas. You capitalize Coulter, just like you would capitalize your own last name. So that's capitalization. Next up, you'll notice that sometimes we make a portmanteau out of some of these common names. And uh, that just means we, we jam two words together to make a, a compound word. And so if you see that, like red cedar is all one word instead of two words. Sometimes you'll also hyphenate a name. So you see yellow poplar is hyphenated there. What that means is our common names are not very accurate. That's an indication that we're calling this a cedar, but it's not a cedar. We're calling this a poplar. It's not a poplar. So anytime you see two simple words stuck together or a hyphen, you should be looking at that and saying, I, I bet this isn't in the genus, I'm going to think it's in. And so cedars are technically in the Cedrus genus. Uh, we'll learn Cedrus deodara, deodar cedar, later this semester in lab. That's a true cedar. It looks nothing like eastern red cedar, which is Juniperus virginiana. virginiana. We're learning that this week in lab. It's a juniper. If we could have done a better job when you know people first started describing these trees in English, it would have been great if they could have named this eastern red juniper because that's what it actually is. And then you would know if you're from hill country, oh, I know ash juniper. Well, it's very similar to Eastern red cedar because they're both actually juniper, okay? So we basically named it wrong because we named it what it looked like, not what it actually was. Yellow poplar is not a poplar. Poplars are in the populus genus, not liriodendron. Crepe myrtle is not actually a myrtle, okay? All the true myrtles are in the Mirica genus. Uh, Osage orange is not actually an orange. True oranges are in the citrus genus. This one's in the Maclura genus. So if you see a hyphen or names stuck together, just know that the common name is lying. 
Sometimes you'll see an X in a common name. Prunus X yetoensis. Okay? So what kind of trees do we have right here by the Washington Monument? Dogwoods is a good guess. They look like that, but it turns out they're not dogwoods. Lynn way in the back there. Yeah, they're cherry trees. Uh, specifically, these are Yoshino cherries that were given to the U.S. by Japan uh, as a gift. And so Yoshino cherry is a hybrid cherry. So this X means they took two different members of this Prunus genus, they hybridized them, and then because this hybrid became so common, they decided to name the hybrid of those two other parent species. So in this case, they named it Yenoensis, but the X lets you know it's not a standalone species, it's a hybrid of two other species. Now, as species uh, are less closely related, it's less likely that the hybrid will be viable. And so the X is almost always between the genus and the specific epithet, because what you had is you had two oaks, Quercus and Quercus, that were able to hybridize. You had two pines, Pinus and Pinus, that were able to hybridize. But imagine trying to hybridize a pine with an oak. That's not going to do anything. That's not going to produce viable offspring. So you almost never see two different genera that could hybridize. We used to think we had one with Leland Cyclus, Leland Cypress. So it would be X cupresso Paris lelandii. And so that's pretty remarkable where they thought it was a tree of a hybrid of two different genera. But then they realized they were just wrong. Uh, and so it wasn't what they thought it was. And now it's considered some hybrid between two trees within the same genus. So I'm not aware of any examples where you have two different genera successfully hybridizing into a name, unnamed hybrid. But you're going to see this with a lot of cherries. You're going to see this with a lot of oaks, a lot of poplars a lot of pines. So these taxa where we have a lot of organisms in one genus, that's where you tend to see a lot of your hybrids. Sometimes we split things up within a species level. So with taxonomy, we've got splitters that want to see every little minute difference and say, hey, that's a new thing, that's a new thing. And then we've got lumpers where, you know, I think most foresters, wildlife biologists probably fall into that lumper category where you just look at it and you say, hey, I can manage all this the same. Let's just call it the same thing. I can treat all this the same. Let's just call it the same thing. Who cares if the leaves are slightly different colors? You know, they have similar silvics, they have similar ecology. Let's not worry about it. So here's an example where there are actually three different species of basswoods. We're going to learn Tilia americana variety Caroliniana here. Um, and that, that variety has a southern distribution. If we looked at variety Americana, that would have a more northern distribution. You might find that in Virginia, northern Arkansas. Um, and then there's a third one, variety Heterophila. We do have those here in East Texas. They just have really white fuzzy backs on the leaves. That's the only difference. These are all the same tree. So we'll learn Carolina basswood in lab, but you'll recognize American basswood or white basswood when you see them because they are the same species. They look like the same tree. Minor morphological differences. So we call that a variety. If you see B-A-R and a third name, that's what's going on there. So when we learn Carolina basswood, you get to fit this whole thing right here into that little specific epithet box on the quiz sheet. So, right, small. Sometimes we'll have subspecies. Subspecies is the same idea as a variety. Minor morphological differences within a species. Uh, so we're going to learn Sambucus niagara subspecies canadensis, American black elderberry this semester. Uh, they've abbreviated SUBSP here, but often you see just SSP, subspecies. That's the abbreviation there. And so again, you've got to fit Niagara subspecies, Canadensis, all in that specific epithet. Okay, um, what I want to talk about now is different levels of identification. Okay, so let's say you only care about identifying something to the genus level. Uh, you've got a genus where all the different species within it are pretty similar. So you really just want to know, hey, what's the genus on that? You don't really care what species it is because they're all similar. There's 40 of them around here. We don't want to take the time to learn them. Let's just worry about what genus it is. Or let's say there's another scenario where you look at a tree. You guys have already learned two maples. So if you see another maple, you'll probably recognize, hey, that's a maple, but you don't know what species it is yet. Well, you at least know it to the genus, you may want to describe that further. So there are some specific abbreviations we can use for that, and we will be using this in lab several times this semester. 
So let's go about the difference between SP period and SPP period. In either case, you replace the specific epithet with this abbreviation. So you are not including the specific epithet, you're just including the genus, so here's an example uh, where we were on the Shrunkies class. Connor is trying to figure out what that shrub in the background is. And we look at it, we, we know it's a blueberry. It looks like a blueberry. It's got blueberries on it. So we know it's a blueberry, but we don't know what species it is. So you ask them, what, what kind of blueberry is that shrub right there? That's one shrub. So because it's one shrub, we know it's only going to be one species. So he doesn't know until we get up. We've got to see if it contains for blueberries. And for right now, we don't know what species it is. There's a lot of dusky salamanders that are in the Desmonathus genus, but there's like 15 of them, and they all look really, really similar. Um, and so, you know, if she's got two of them in her hand there, or we just don't care which species it is, then it's Desmonathus spp. So we're saying we've got this group, there may be multiple different species here, but we know they're all in the same genus, so all we care about is what genus they're in. So the best way to describe spp period is, you know, the genus. You don't know the specific epithet, but either you don't care about the specific epithet or it's plural. You've got multiple individuals that may be multiple different species. So think of it as plural unknown specific epithet. Here's another example where we'll use this in a uh, lab. So uh, there's Mike Hartford out during timber cruising week of field station. I, I didn't think it was going to work when he did it. We had a stand where the blackberry was like 15 feet tall and really, really thick. It was tearing people up. So he duct taped bark from a dead tree onto his jeans to make himself some uh, impromptu chaps there. Turned out it actually worked pretty well. But here's Mike back tired from lunch. How's timber cruising going? The blackberry genus is Rubus. That Rubus SPP almost killed me. There was a bunch of it out there. It was probably a bunch of different species, but all we care about is knowing it's a genus. So when we learned blackberry and raspberry in lab this semester, you can put Rubus in the, in the genus box, SPP period in the specific epithet box, and that's full credit on a quiz, okay? Because there are lots of species of blueberry, we don't care which one. When we learn hawthorn in lab this semester, there's like 40 different hawthorn, small trees, native here in East Texas, you know, that would be probably 20% of our whole tree list, just hawthorns. So we're just gonna learn them all lumped together, basically. Uh, we just need you to know that it is a hawthorn, it really doesn't matter as much which hawthorn it is. Okay, so that's a little bit on some of the conventions with scientific names, some background on taxonomy. Uh, we've got two more things I wanna go over for the rest of the day. Uh, one is I wanna give you again, that 100,000 foot overview of basically how all plants evolved and we classified them. So you can kind of see that rough tree of life for plants with a focus specifically on woody plants. And then what I wanna do is talk about a little what I call non-taxonomic taxonomy. Some of these different groups of trees uh, that we use and how we describe. So I'm going to show you a bunch of diagrams like this. And so they generally work from the left to the right. As evolution is progressing in time, you're moving from the left to the right. And as you accumulate more differences with mutations and speciation occurs, you get splits into more and more taxa. Now you can see on here, some of them are lowercase and italicized. Some of them are uppercase and bolded. The uppercase bolded ones have some significant woody species in them. The lowercase italicized ones really don't have much in the way of woody species in them, um, or they're just not around anymore. Okay? And so as we look here, we start with all land plants. Well, let's think about it. You've got plants that are in aquatic environments, oceans, lakes, streams, and then eventually somehow they manage to move on to land. And so you get your first land plants developed. And so if you're looking at that very first community of plants on land that have been used to living in water, 
What's one of the first things they have to develop now that they're living as a community on land? So they need what? Lungs. Lungs? Well, plants don't have lungs, lungs. right? Yeah, you're thinking animals. Animals would need lungs, but not plants. So what's the first thing this community of plants needs is they start competing with one another. What do they have to start being able to do that they didn't have to worry about in the water? What's that? Retaining water is going to be important. They have to come up with ways where they can dry out and survive or not. And so uh, one of this groups here, the bryophytes we'll talk about in a moment, has gotten very effective at that. Okay, so that is important. What else are they going to have to do, though, as they start competing with one another? So you've got all these plants. They've been in the water, just floating, and now they're on land. They're right beside each other. They're going to have to start rooting. Yeah, absolutely. They're going to have to start because they were getting nutrients from the water. Now they have to go get it from the soil. So they are going to have to develop rooting. Saw Tim's hand go up in the back. Exactly. They have to get taller. They can't just float higher up in the water to get more light now. They have to grow in height, which is going to lead to root development. And so with that, they basically need to develop plumbing. They need to get taller. They can't dry out. So they need to be able to get water from the soil up to the top of them. And so they develop plumbing, okay? They develop tracheas. And so that's why we have the tracheophytes developing here, which all our trees today come from, versus the bryophytes. We still have a lot of bryophytes around. Those are mosses, where they're not very tall. They can dry completely out. Then you wet them up, they come right back to life. Mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. So that they don't really have stems that have any significant height. So no trees there. Okay, so we've developed plumbing. Then you split into two more groups. So we have to think about what we develop next. So you've got height growth now. So they're at height competing with one another where the tallest ones are gonna get more light. But what, they, what can they do once they're tall now to get even more light, even if they're taller than something next to them? Yeah, they can get wider. Okay, so yeah, develop leaves, right? So a leaf is just a solar panel, basically. You can think of it that way. So they develop leaves. Uh, so you have the lycophytes where they just have photosynthetic branches. So they did get wider. The lycophytes used to get up to about six feet in DDH, which would give them more surface area for more photosynthesis. But the euphilophytes, EU means true, phil means leaf. So these are the true leaf bearing plants. They figured out how to deploy solar panels, okay? So they could get even more light, now compete trees that just had photosynthetic stems. Uh, the lycophytes are still around today. None of them around today are very tall or woody or tree-like, uh, but they used to get six foot DBH and 130 feet tall. So they used to be tree-like in stature before they got basically outcompeted by the euphilophytes. Um, there are, there's probably evidence of lycophytes in this room right here, right now. They got that big during the Carboniferous period they fell down in inland seas and swamps. They got sedimented in over time and pressure building up over time as this happened over millions and millions of years, compressed them into coal. So we're burning coal here in East Texas that's got some of these lights on right here right now. And some of that probably would have come from lycophytes 130 or more million years ago that are now coal. Um, so there's the lycophytes and the euphilophytes. And then all our plants basically evolved from the euphilophytes that we're learning in lecture and lab. Ferns and horsetails, not many trees or woody species there, so we don't learn about them this semester. And we've already talked about angiosperms and gymnosperms, our first big division uh, for our, our different woody species. And of course, there's a lot of non-woody members that are angiosperms and gymnosperms as well, but we're really just focused on the woody. Let's start with the gymnosperms first. And we're starting here because there are fewer of them, so it's simpler to go over it. And we can actually go over these at a greater level of detail because it's not as diverse as the angiosperms. We only have four orders of gymnosperms, and I'll talk about those in just a moment. But let's uh, start with the coniferales, because when we think gymnosperms, most of what all of us are thinking is going to be in the coniferales. Uh, depending on the taxonomy you're following, you might also see this listed as the pinales. Same thing. There are only seven families there in the coniferales. And when we look at two of these, the Sciatopidiaceae is a species in Japan. The Cephalotaxaceae is a handful of species in the Pacific. 
So we don't even really focus on those much at all. So we're really just looking at the other five. The Pinaceae is gonna be one of the most economically important orders of trees. Uh, there are only 11 genera there, but there are 225 species of, that are woody and tree-like. And so we really have our greatest diversity of species in the Pinaceae. These are primarily found in the Northern Hemisphere, but not exclusively. The Cupress ACE now has 30 different genera. So it's got more genera by far than any of these other families, but only 133 species. So not as many species, but a lot more genera. So very diverse within the Cupress ACE. And they're found on every continent except which one? Antarctica doesn't have trees, a little cold. Um, so they're found on all six other continents. The Podocarp ACE is primarily Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we're currently aware of about 185 different tree species in the Podocarp ACE, but we've done less research on our Southern Hemisphere forest compared to our Northern Hemisphere forest. So it's possible that the Podocarps are actually the most diverse uh, family that we have of gymnosperm. We just have to discover them. The Araucariaceae has three genera and 41 species, uh, and these are almost exclusively Southern Hemisphere. So we'll talk about these when we talk about trees of Australia and South America, the Agathis genus, the Araucaria genus, and the Wallenia genus. Taxaceae is your ewes um, and your toreas, uh, except for a few species where they're uh, extracting uh, chemicals that are used in chemotherapy. These are largely understudied, but you're only looking at about five uh, genera there, not very many species. So that's basically all the coniferators. As we look at those other three orders of gymnosperms, the psychedelics, you would look at it and think you had a palm tree. Uh, you do see these planted ornamentally in the South and East Texas. So you can certainly see these around. 300 species, two or three families, 10 to 12 genera. But when you look at them, you would never think, hey, that's a gymnosperm. Ginkgo is a pretty easy order. The ginkgo ailes order just has this one tree and a ginkgo biloba is monotypic. It's the only member of its order. It's the only member of its family. It's sort of a, you know, evolutionary dead end. Everything that was more closely related to this tree is now extinct. So you can kind of describe it as a living fossil for that reason. So there's one tree in the ginkgo ACE. Uh, in the Neetales, you've got these three families, uh, including some tropical vines in the Neetase. Uh, the Wellwich ACE family has this one weird species, uh, Wellwichia, and this is found out, you can see how arid this area is. It's just rocks and then only this plant. That thing could be 100 years old, okay? Uh, so they just sit there, they don't look like much, but they're surviving very harsh climates. And then we will talk more about the ephedra ACE when we talk about trees of South America. Um, these are used for stimulants, so you can get ephedra out of it. If you take pseudophed, that's pseudoephedrine, so it's a synthesized ephedrine. And the, the one thing everyone knows, ephedra has gone on to be used for, it's one of the ingredients in methamphetamines. Uh, so there's a lot of trade for uh, drugs uh, based around chemicals that can be naturally produced in this ephedra ACE. And then the coniferales, I already talked about all the families in there, but again, this is gonna be our most economically important order of trees probably in the world, okay? All the species that we have significant timber management in, in most parts of the world where we have plantation, forestry, very intensive management, it's almost all in the coniferales where we're managing spruces, firs, pines, larches, um, those sort of taxa. Okay, so that was all the gymnosperms in a couple minutes. Uh, next up, we have our angiosperms. And so when you look at our angiosperms, almost all our angiosperms are down here as either monocots or eudicots, true dicots. And we already talked last class a little bit about the difference between monocots and dicots. Um, but what I wanna go over before we break those down even more is look at the primitive angiosperms here, where we've got the amaryllales and the ostrobaleales, the trees in them. And then we have this group that kind of evolved together, and that's the magnolia clade. And so that's four orders, the magnolia the loraleales, the canal and the piper -ales. 
So I'm going to go through these two first, then we'll go through the magnolia plate, and then we'll break down the monocotic dicotyl. So ember ailes, like the ginkgo ailes, is monotypic. It's got one species left in the whole order. I think it's the oldest living angiosperm, or sort of, you know, the modern representation of that first evolved angiosperm that's still around, at least. Um, and so it's found on this tiny island out in the middle of the Pacific, east of Australia, um, Amorella tricopoda. And it's, you know, again, kind of a living fossil where there's, you know, not many of them around other than this one little island, an evolutionary dead end. Angiosperms have vessels to transport water up and down the stem, which are kind of like big pipes, very efficient at transporting water. An oak tree with so many leaves versus a pine with the same area of leaves that oak should be able to transmit way more water, okay? Um, but this has tracheates like a gymnosperm. So it has primitive plumbing basically, and other features where we can see it just, it hasn't had time yet to develop a lot of the features that the angiosperms ended up developing. The Australobaleales is about 100 species, including three different families, some of which only have a handful of species in them. Uh, the one in here that everyone may be familiar with uh, you may have this in your spice cabinet, right? So anyone recognize that? Yeah, star anise, exactly. And so that's going to be an example of something coming out of the Australopithecus. But we really don't cover this much more this semester at all. Okay, so now we're in the four orders in the Magnolia clade that evolved together, and we will get to some of these in lecture and lab. So you can see some of these families. There's only a handful of species out in the Pacific. But the Anonaceae, the custard apple family, is very diverse, and we'll learn pawpaw this semester in lab uh, that's in the Anonaceae family. We've already learned two trees in the Magnoliaceae family, and there's about 223 more. Um, and then we won't get to anything in the Maristicaceae, but that's the other family in the Magnoliaceae. Here's the Laureales. The Laureales is a cool order because you can kind of think of all these trees as being a chemical store. They produce lots of aromatic chemicals. So usually there's a, a lot of fragrance uh, with these trees. And we're gonna see that. We're not gonna get into any of these families except the Loraceae. But within the Loraceae family, we're gonna learn three trees in lab, red bay, spice bush, and sassafras, which you see there. And they're all very aromatic. You can ID all of them by scent alone if you really want. Here's the Canellales. It's only 136 species. They're also very aromatic, so we're seeing a lot of that in the Magnolia clade. And we're going to learn uh, one member of the Winter ACE family from South America uh, later this semester, Drimmy's Winter Eye. There's the Piper Ailes. We really don't get into this at all this semester. Uh, the Aristolochiaceae, the Birthwort family. Uh, and we do have Dutchman's Pipes, are the common name for this vine. We do have these growing here in East Texas. Uh, you'll see them at Cape so that was all the primitive angiosperms. And then remember, we had two groups at the bottom. We had the monocots and the dicots. Let's go over the monocots first. And you can see the monocots are only divided here into about 10 orders. And if you look at those 10 orders, only half of them have trees. With many of the monocots, they don't get that true secondary woody growth where your tree would throw on growth rings each year. They may just start with a very large uh, meristem, like a palm tree, think about a palm tree, and basically it just kind of goes up in segments. So based on some definitions of a tree, monocots don't really fit that definition. But again, these are plants with big sticks up the middle, so we're gonna call them trees. So here's the asparagales. Uh, so orchids and agaves are in there. So if you're east of Los, An Los Angeles and you go to Joshua Tree National Park, okay, those are Joshua trees are going to be in the Asparagales order. And then we have the agave. So here's an example of an agave here. And so what are we using the agaves for? Tequila. Yeah, they're used for tequila. And uh, I think maybe also the hand sanitizer in our vans here. Um, but there you've got the uh, agaves there, like that blue agave. Uh, we're going to learn yuccas, you know, that look very similar to this this semester. So few in lecture, few in lab. We've got the pandanales, which again, like the psychedales, which was a gymnosperm, they're tropical. Everyone looks at them and says, oh, that's a palm tree. So they look just like palms. Uh, we won't get into that much at all. But here are the true palms and the aracales. 
Uh, these used to be in the Paul Macy, so they've changed the taxonomy around a little. These are very economically important in tropical areas within the world, and all parts of them are used for all sorts of different things. Uh, from the, the leaves can be used for different types of roofing. Parts of palm out of the stems can be used for food. Uh, the fruits produced by some of them, like the coconut palm, can be used for food. Um, they can be used for building materials, fibers. So uh, there's lots of uses in lots of parts of the world uh, for different palm trees. Of course, they make a great ornamental as well, right? So very economically important, very diverse. We've got the poe at least. That's the grass order. So all our grasses are in that. So this, of course, is going to be critical for rangelands, right? Where they'll have many, many different types of grasses. Some of our more open woodlands have many different species of grasses, but only a few of them are going to be woody and grow like these bamboo examples here. So we'll get giant cane and lab, which is a larger grass species that can get 20 feet tall or so. This Poales order is probably the most economically important order of plants in the whole world. Why would that be? What's in this group? Yes, I heard someone out here say wheat, corn. So a lot of our cereal grains are in the Poales. Wheat, corn, barley, rice. And so a lot of our cereal crops, and thus most of our food um, actually comes out of the Poales order. Although none of those taxa are really talked about. Uh, here's the zinc gibberales. Uh, that's got bananas in it as an example. And of course, we've all seen the, the issues with bananas now with the mostly all one clone. That clone is susceptible to a disease, and so it's not looking good for a lot of the production bananas right now. But there are other species there as well. And so that's it for the monocots. That's all the monocots. Um, because the dicots are so diverse within the angiosperms, I really can't get into much level of detail with you. They're split into the primitive eudicots, so we can look at these four families, give you a little detail there. But then I'll show you how many uh, families are in uh, the rosid clade and the asterisk clade, uh, which are our two largest groups of dicots. So as we look here at the primitive dicots, uh, we've got a few different families here. Proteaceae has macadamia nuts in it. We, most people think macadamia nuts come from Hawaii. They're actually from South Africa. They've been moved to Hawaii. There's an example there. Uh, the platinaceae that we'll learn American sycamore in this week in lab, that's going to be in the proteales as well. The procodendrales is this weird group with two species in Asia, and they kind of evolved backwards, which is unusual. So their ancestors, if we think they had vessel elements, but then uh, these two members of the Trochodendraceae, they went back from vessel elements to tracheids, which is the more primitive feature. So kind of a, a move backwards in evolution, which is unusual. We've got the Caryophyllales. that's incredibly diverse, over 11,000 species, 6% of all dicots. Uh, it includes cacti, a whole bunch of other taxa. And then we've got the Santillales. Uh, this includes some parasitic vines. Uh, so we've already seen mistletoe, that big green ash we learned last week in lab had mistletoe on it. That's a member of the Santa Leo. So we've already seen some of these. And that was the, the primitive, more primitive dicots. But as we look now at the rosid clade and the asterid clade, this is all the level of detail I have for you. Because this is tens upon thousands of species. Um, so as we look through here, we see a lot of orders that do have a lot of trees in them. And so you can see the Fabales has our legumes in it. Uh, the Rosales has all our plums, cherries, trees like that. The Fagales has all our oaks, beech, chestnuts in it. Uh, the Sapindales is going to have our maples in it. So a lot of the trees that we're learning in lab are going to be in the roses clade. And then a lot of the trees we're learning in lab are also going to be in the asterid clade, uh, where we have the Aquifoliales here. Uh, which has our, all our hollies in it, the cornales with all our dogwoods, the ericales with a lot of our blueberries and other ericaceous shrubs, um, the asterales with species such as eastern bats. So again, not much detail at all, but it's just a thousand upon thousand. Very, very good. Okay, so what I want to wrap up with today in the last few minutes just giving you a few examples on some of what I'm calling non-taxonomic taxonomy. So some of this is actually based on taxonomy where we have different groups of plants that evolve different traits. 
some of this is just based on ways that we've come practically to describe different groups of trees, and it may have very little to do with how they're actually related from a taxonomic standpoint. So we've got soft pines and hard pines. All the pines we're learning in lab are hard pines. So these are all gonna have two or three needles per fascicle. The umbos on the cones are all gonna be armed, so they're all prickly. The wood's pretty hard, which is why we grow a lot of these species and manage them for timber, okay? The soft pines, uh, there's examples we'll learn in lectures. So Eastern white pine, Western white pine, uh, they have five needles per fascicle. The fascicle sheath falls off, so it's less visible. You can grab those cones. They may have resin on them and be sticky, but they don't have those prickly armed umbos, and they generally have softer wood. These are the trees that you see steel using in timber sports on ESPN, because it makes you look real strong uh, when you split a tree apart with an ax real quick got really soft wood. So uh, we're not learning any of these in lab though. We don't have any native to these texts. We're learning a lot of hickories this semester and we've got these true hickories versus the pecan hickories. And so we've already learned a true hickory last week's shag mark. And generally the true hickories don't have very many leaflets. The leaflets out at the apical part of that compound leaf, so towards the tip, have bigger leaflets. The husk on the nut won't have a wing coming off it, and we haven't seen that yet. Um, and then they'll have imbricate scales on the buds. When you think about pecan, and the other pecan hickories, like bitter nut hickory, they have a lot of leaflets. All the leaflets are similar in size. The buds look different because they have the two valvate scales on them, although they don't really look like tulip buckler buds at all. And then they have far fewer buds and scales. That's the difference. Okay, I already talked about this with my lab groups last week, uh, but for the other folks, we've got red oaks versus white oaks. So the one way to tell them apart is the bristle tip on the leaf. Red oaks have it, white oaks don't. So there'll be a little bristle sticking off the end of the leaf. Um, the one wood difference is right here. So Red oak doesn't have tyloses, white oak does have these tyloses, and they keep the wood from leaking when you make it into a barrel. So cooperage is barrel making. So wines, whiskeys, beers, other thing we're aging in barrels is in white oak barrels, not in red oak fruit barrels. Okay? And so that's a huge industry from Missouri east on over to Kentucky, a major hardwood industry. There's two wildlife differences. The acorns are generally more stringent with more tannin on red oak, so less preferred, and the acorns are generally more palatable with less tannin on white oak. That makes a lot of very good more complex story than that, but the pros over some of And then from the time the pollen hits the flower, it takes you two years to drop an acorn on the ground and get a red oak. It takes you one year to drop an acorn on the ground with a white oak. And so the, the flowers that broke open right when COVID started back in March here on our spring break, they're going to drop acorns for white oaks this year. Next fall, they'll drop acorns for red oaks. And that means if you have a freeze, late freeze in March or April that kills those flowers, the, the fall after the freeze, no white oak acorns, a year and a half after the freeze, no red oak acorns. So from a wildlife standpoint, have both types of oaks, that way if something happens, hopefully one of them will produce fruit in a given year. And then we talk about hardwoods and softwoods. Generally, hardwoods we mean angiosperms, softwoods we mean gymnosperms. There are absolutely examples where you can find many hardwoods like oaks that have harder wood than many softwoods like pines, but there's examples the other way. If you take a slow-grown longleaf pine and try to put a nail into it, compared to a birch that you've grown quickly, you'd much rather put the nail in that birch long, because uh, it's going to be soft. Right here, so. A lot of universal trees to keep in mind, we really need angiosperms and gymnosperms when we talk about hardwood versus 